Hi there. Thanks for joining us on Let's Talk Taste with Sherry, where we're saving the earth one flavor at a time by gathering community to share wisdom around the natural connections between our innate sense of taste and flavors that are grown in healthy, regenerative soils. Welcome. Hey there, Sherry Hess with The Flavor Remedy. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Let's Talk Taste with Sherry. All right, guys, this is like, this is a foundational video. This is a video that, had I done it in the first episode, you may have been like, what? But now that you've been paying attention, you've been following along, you understand the concept of how flavor can save the earth. Um, we're gonna dive deep into what these five categories of flavor are. And I have been talking about this for years. I have been questioning it. My curiosity is constantly piqued around this idea of why do we actually have taste buds, right? And, and what, what are we experiencing? If our taste buds are given to us for the reason of detecting nutrition, because we are humans and we are built in this miraculous way, and our taste buds are not superficial. They're there for a reason, just like all of our senses are there for a reason. You know, this curiosity that I've had for years and years and years around this has, has taken me down paths that in my brain, I know exactly how this works. I know exactly how to describe the five categories of flavor and what the nutrition should be behind them. But what I'm finding after years in my brain of collecting information is that when I try to explain that, it doesn't always come out in a way that makes sense to people that have never heard of this concept before. So today I'm inviting my friend Ron Ben Joseph to come on and interview me so that we can create this engaging conversation around um, what does this look like and how can how can we how can shifting the mindset from things like carbs and proteins, and you know whatever dietary rules there are into this conversation of flavor and using flavor as this driving force um, of experiencing a healthier way of eating and a more pleasurable way of eating. So welcome, Ron. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me back as always. <laughs> yes. um, you know, I love that you said that. I love that you talked about um, dietary uh, guidelines or constrictions, as I like to think of it. I've been on a diet like every day of my life since four years old, uh, when I was sort of being heavy and stuff. Four, and, uh, like maybe four six. I remember six years old. This oh, is so funny. That's so sad. Well, because I I, <laughs> I, I I puffed up very quickly. Like around five 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 years old, I started getting heavy, and um, for a lot of stress reasons and stuff. We were moving around the world a lot. And uh, I remember at six or seven being like going to uh, a friend's house and they were like, do you want anything to drink? And they had Coca-Cola and I'm a child of the eighties. So I was like, yeah, I want the Coca-Cola. But I was like, no, I, I just want to die. Whatever's diet, like the diet version or, you know, something mm -hmm. that's dietetic or whatever. And I remember being at like six or seven being like, no, I just want the diet thing, you know, <sighs> which, which at that time to me meant, right. Like the void of what I really want it constriction. Right. It meant, giving up. And so um, it, it's funny that through talking with you, I, I, I think a lot about that where I'm like, man, oh man, like I don't, there's, there's very little, even now I, I'm dairy free, gluten free, uh, which, which I love. It, it feels really good. It's, it's sustainable, but um, I, it's just good for my body, but there's very little nuance or variance to the flavors in my food. Like it's pretty clear. I literally probably just exist in umami, sweet, not too much people like umami and salty. That's pretty much where I live, right? So I kind of, yeah, like I want to talk to you about like flavors that I'm that I'm not even exposed to, like sour. I was thinking about sour. Like sour, I have no relationship to sour. I love pineapples um, and oranges, but I, I don't eat them too much because it hurts my stomach. So like, what does sour do? Like how does sour really affect me? Like what is the point of sour? Who invented sour? I'm just kidding, you know, no one invented sour. But like, what? tell me like the, the real root of sour, the, the impact that sour could have. Yeah, so sour, you know, one of, one of the, I think the most effective ways to describe sour to people. So sour is acidic, right? Um, and in the world, like you could even translate this into food safety. When you go into, well, that's probably a very complicated episode, but 
acidity basically creates an environment in which pathogens can't grow from a food safety standpoint. But from like from a, a consuming sour flavor standpoint, what I like to kind of give examples to people are things that are typically probiotic, right? So if you think about yogurt, kombucha, um, I don't know, give me another like healthy probiotic to digestive supportive thing. Like those two, those two are the first that come to come to mind, right? These are two things that we're told that we're given to them. They are given to us or suggested to us, you know, by a nutritionist or, or someone who understands that you're having gut issues, right? Oh, fermented foods is the other thing, right? Fermented kimchi and, you know, real pickles that are fermented. These are, these are biological, um, processes that are meant to support your digestion right so that's what sour that's what sour does sour is if you think about what's in your stomach right we had the episode about papaya and this whole idea of the um you know the papaya tasting like the digestive juices so this whole idea that sour can actually support your digestion can be very much represented in these flavor wise in these foods that are being promoted as digestive supportive, right? I mean, digest, digestive juices are acidic. Acid is what breaks down your, your, you know, your, your food and helps you digest your food. So um, that's the easiest kind of reference to go to this place where a living flavor of sour. So for instance, these fermented vegetables, these things that have these, these probiotics and these, these beneficial bacteria, right? The sour flavor is coming from the actual fermentation process and the beneficial bacteria that are in it. So that sour is very different from a non-living sour, which is, you know, you see the ingredient citric acid. It's one of these ingredients that in almost everything these days because it is a preservative because it does create the environment where you know food is less susceptible to pathogens which is the whole point of food safety right and and because it says citric we just assume that this is you know a squeeze of lime or a squeeze of lemon right but it's a completely chemical there's no component left of citrus in it it's just something we call citric acid right and there's a lot of verbiage around um, ingredients that we make assumptions for. And that's of course on purpose, but. Well, and, and that's something that we were talking about today, like earlier before we were recording that this idea that like in living flavors, it's, it's not just one thing, right? Like, like a, a pineapple is sweet too. Right. Um, and bitter, like there's parts right. of it that are bitter or right. There's variations, but implicitly, like you're saying, if I, if I'm hearing this correctly, is like, when we when we categorize one big idea like like sauerkraut is sour right like right. so there's a lot of variations there's bitter to the to the cabbage or it's cabbage right sauerkraut's cabbage yeah 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 right there's saltiness to it to the brining or whatever. but at at its root it is sour how do we differentiate like between all the flavors to categorize one big like how does something become categorized as just sour just salty just sweet you know what i'm saying um, so how does it become categorized? You mean in how our food is presented to us? Like I, this is, I'm, I am throwing you for a loop. We are talking, I was like, I'm not, I don't ask hardball <laughs> questions. I just did. Cause something that we've been talking a lot about in conversation is, 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 uh, is this idea of categorizing flavors. Right. So you just like, cause I'm, I, the, it, on one hand, I hear you say that flavors have a multitude of nuance and a multitude of different flavors within one flavor. And yet on the other hand, I was thinking, I was like, I don't eat enough sour foods. What makes one, what makes foods be categorized as like more sour than sweet? You know, like an orange could be sweet. Right. Right. So it's, it's, you know, it's different acidity levels of things. Um, so you know, you can probably take an apple, an orange, a pineapple, and, and this is, you know, this is kind of a place that I hope to go with these episodes, right, is to have people come on and talk to, talk to me about these compounds, talk to me about these compounds that we know, you know, maybe we call them an antioxidant, maybe we call them um, a flavonoid, right, these are all things that scientists will study 
from the perspective of whatever it is, however it's being um, you know, analyzed for the current purpose in uh, current study or whatever, right? So the levels of sour are gonna come from the levels of whatever these compounds are that are within the food itself. And, and what we do in the world of flavor and what we what we what scientists are studying right there's there's this whole concept of well we as humans lean into salty and sweet right so we're going to create things that are appealing to people and put a lot of salty and sweet in them and we're going to change the language of things we're going to talk about sour means it's not ripe which is true right if you take a fruit like a mango for instance that isn't ripe. And in our brains in the Western world, we think, oh, well, it's not ripe, it's not ready, it's not good. And yet in, um, in India, they sell a spice called amchur, which is literally green mangoes that haven't been ripened yet, that they dry and turn into powder. And the flavor is sour. You would never taste amchur and think it was mango unless you grew up understanding that that's what an unripe mango tastes like, right? So. We hear unripe and we think, oh, well, that's not ready or it's not good or it's not sweet enough, but there's benefits to it in both stages, right? So, so plants go through these transitions, not only of like growth and changing, but there's different benefits as they have these different compounds in them. So the level of sour, you know, there's, there's definitely a nutritional interpretation to it. We just don't know what that is. You, but it, I, it made sense to me when you said compound, like, and I was not good at science, but like compound makes sense to me. It's so, and then I'm looking at like your paintings, right? Like, so purple is not, pur I acknowledge what purple is, right? I know what purple is. I'm not colorblind. Like I, like, I, I'm like, I know what purple is. I think you and I have a similar definition to what purple is, right? I'm looking at the painting, but purple is not just one thing. Purple is a compound of blue and red. So how deep the purple is, how light the purple is, that's that's a compound of, a, of that's a hue of a certain amount of colors. Right. But we categorize it as purple. Right. Oh. Yeah, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful analogy. Yeah, you could totally, painting is, oh my gosh, you just like completely exist, like justified my existence as an artist because <laughs> combining flavors is completely like combining colors to get a new thing, right? to get okay. a new result. Yeah, so now I'm all in, now I get it. Okay, this is this is so huge for us. I'm glad it happened on the recording. Oh, this is perfect. So now let's go, let's, uh, so uh, let's talk salty then. So what is categorized as salty? What is the hue, what is the compound that adds up to salty and how does it help me? How does it help my body? Okay, so salty is one of those conversations. It's, it's, it's similar to sweet, but almost more narrow-minded. So when people think about salty flavor, right? They immediately go to an ingredient and then there's a whole battle around well should i eat iodized salt or kosher salt or pink himalayan salt or you know there's not really any difference in salts you talk to a cardiologist and the salt is the salt is the salt and you really just have to look at your sodium content and and there's truth in all of that right there's there's truth in questioning all of these things do i think that bleached iodized salt has the same nutritional support as you know pink himalayan salt or a true sea salt coming from the ocean that has all these other you know, living things in it? No, I don't. But I also don't believe that just using a different salt is the answer to all of our salt issues, right? We need to recognize that salty flavors exist outside of a salt shaker. Like the flavor of saltiness comes from food. You can pick up on saltiness in food. When you stopped eating, when you, you know, during COVID, you started cooking for yourself, you're not eating out anymore, you're not eating as much, you know, you're not going to Chipotle, you're not taking your daughter to Chipotle, you're eating your own food, you're cooking your own food, you're in control of the flavors. All of a sudden you decide to go out and go to Chipotle. And, and I used to love, about, right? I used to love Chipotle. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. And all of a sudden it tastes extra salty. So your body's adjusting to getting this flavor from, you know, other sources because you're not pouring a bunch of salt on your on your food. So what is to answer your question, what is what is salt and what is the compound? You know, it's the flavor itself. It doesn't just come from sodium chloride. You can get a saltiness from different combinations. Um, 
you know, eating celery. Celery is the perfect example of a living flavor of a salty flavor, right? You don't put salt on your celery. It's salty as it is. But taking that, that whole ingredient, that living flavor of salt, and then adding that to your salads or to your soups, or, you know, you can recognize that you can get salt from other sources except for a shaker. You know, salt be, is one of those, I call it an emotionally charged flavor because we're all told to avoid it, just like we're all told to avoid sugar, right? And I just kind of stand up and I put a stake in the ground and I say, look, stop demonizing the category of the flavor and start looking at why. Why are we experiencing the, this inundated amount of sweetness and saltiness, right? And why are we being programmed that these are the only two flavors that taste good? Because we are, we really are. And we have the power to change that by, you know, exposing ourselves to, to different flavors. But it's yet to be this powerful conversation, right? But, but that was a decision, right? Like there's a decision by food makers, by researchers, by food scientists that said, like, you know what, these are the ones that people want the most, right? Well, yeah, and there's, you know, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to try to demonize the food world, but I do want to question the motive sometimes, right? Because as a business, you want people to eat your food and you want them to keep coming back. And, you know, there's, there's this, you know, the category of sweetness that we talked about that we're all kind of like, well, is it good to eat sweet? Is it bad to eat sweet? Um, it's definitely predominant in in the food industry right and, and even in like growing of food like science is out there trying to create a sweeter apple right have you noticed how apples have gotten sweeter over the years like just biting into an apple itself is sweeter than it used to be um honey crisps yeah and then like, they're delicious right yeah so it's it's hard to know for sure why right but it's just an existing situation that we're in that sweet and salty are the things that we believe are the only things that taste good and and from a flavor perspective when you are only putting or concentrating on those flavors as this thing that we lean into we tend to miss out on the other beneficial flavors that can be more interesting than salty and sweet, that can also become the element of flavor that, be, that makes you feel satiated. So when you take bitter- I was gonna say of, bitter, yeah. Yeah, so when bitter is taken out of processed foods and you're using you know, a processed sugar that has no elements of you know, and no ingredients whatsoever in a product that gives you that bitter flavor, your body's not going to self-regulate and say, okay, I've had enough. So that whole feeling of satiation when there's no bitter present because bitter is, you know, being portrayed as poison when bitter should be portrayed as detoxifying, right? Like if you think about medicine, yeah, too much medicine is bad for you, but the right amount of medicine is beneficial. I don't even have to use the word medicine, you know, probably a better word is just de detoxification, right? Like bitter is detoxifying. Bitter helps things process in your body. It helps move things along. It helps, you know, get rid of waste. And from a flavor and eating perspective, when you're eating bitter, you know, the natural tendency of our bodies should be when we've had enough medicine I'm good. I don't need any more, right? If you took the categories of, of sweet and you just looked at like an apple versus a, a white processed chocolate cookie, right? They're both sweet. And you think, okay, I need something sweet. Let's just say you're having an energetic dip in your day. You think, oh, I need something sweet, right? So you go and you reach for the apple. If you eat an apple and you get that satiation of, of the sweetness, you get a little energy, you're moving on in your day. And do you really reach for another apple and then another apple and then another apple? But you reach for the cookie instead and you eat the cookie. You're like, oh, that was really good. I need another cookie, right? So then a whole sleeve of cookies later, 
you feel like crap, but you've been choosing this flavor and you're eating and you're eating and you're eating, right? But there's no, there's no trigger there to help you feel satisfied. So, you know, this is something that I just, these are all observations, right? These are, these are my brain. This is my brain coming up with, well, why, 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 why? And if, if this is a thing that bitter helps us to feel satiated, why aren't we eating more bitter? And I always say, you know, I, I talk to people that we talk about trend diets all the time, right? Who's going to tell us what now is the right thing to eat? And people have success on these things, right? So clearly if you have success on a, on a diet or a protocol, you're going to be like, well, yeah, it works. Of course it works. I lost 15 pounds. I feel amazing. I have all this energy, right? My skin is better. There's so many things. But I always say, okay, I'm going to look at your diet from a bitter standpoint. How much more bitter have you just brought into your world, whether you taste the bitter or not, right? Because now, because we all need something to be sweet, the, you know, the, the nutraceutical world or the world of, you know, shakes and the health food world, right? They're all, they're all making stuff that if you just tasted it straight up for the ingredients, it would be bitter, but they're coating it in, in sweetness, right? whether it's real sugar or artificial sweetener or stevia or whatever, they're coating it in sweetness because that's what we like. And that's what that, that, that sweetness allows us to say, oh, okay, I'll eat that. Flavor is always the choice we make. Flavor is always the choice that we make. Flavor is the reason why diets fail because they don't know how to make bitter taste good. Right. Um, and, 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 Flavor is why these, why there's success in these shake companies, right? So if you, if all of a sudden you're eating something that has been flavored beyond what the ingredients are, you can accept it. You can then choose. You can then make that choice based on flavor because in your brain, it tastes like a chocolate shake, even though you know, right? And even if you took the, the beauty of that, so it's easy to be like, oh, and I do this this is my chocolate steak syndrome thing, right? As I go, oh, we're eating all this protein. We're eating the, the quantity of a protein, which technically should take what tastes like, you know, a hunk of meat and we're making it taste like chocolate. And why do we do that? And I just explained why we do that, right? But at the same time, it's like, if we're ever gonna trust our own bodies and our own flavor, which is my goal, then it doesn't make any sense for me to drink this chocolate flavored steak, right? So it depends what your goal is here. But what I'm proposing is when we understand the flavors as they're meant to be, so umami is what the basis of that shake should be, right? If it's all protein, whether it's coming from peas or hemp seeds or you know, grass-fed beef or whatever, the basis of that should taste like umami. Umami isn't even a flavor that people really know what it is they think it's like an ingredient on an asian menu right i always think it, i always think of it as and i don't know i don't have a great relationship with meat i mean i eat it but like i'm not in love with it like people are um outside of bacon i love the but uh that i get excited about but uh to me it's like i always associate it with like a fleshy feel that yeah i mean so it's like the a flavor texture. of protein yeah so, so there's and texture is a whole different conversation right texture is a big reason why we eat or don't eat, choose to eat things as well. But yeah, the, that's a that's a great description. I mean, it's been described as a meaty flavor, right? And then, but but what I always introduce to people, if you're, if you're talking about umami and you're talking about that meaty flavor, it's not just meat. You can instantly taste, you know, a portobello mushroom and you immediately, you also have the texture there, right? You have that texture of meat. Um, but that flavor is still there. So in your brain, you can create a correlation of flavor between a piece of piece of meat and a mushroom, right? So that's the umami flavor. And you can even carry that over into a leafy green. So kale is a higher protein green, right? And a lot of people don't think they like kale. They'll throw it in a smoothie. They'll, you know, chop it up fine because it is harder to chew. We also, you know, become this society that doesn't want to chew things anymore and um so if you were to eat a piece of iceberg lettuce next to a piece of kale 
right? And imagine this in your mind or go out to the store and buy it and do this comparison, right? Eating that piece of iceberg is crisp and, and watery and, you know, and I'm not saying there's not nutrients in iceberg. It has its own category of things that it can benefit you from. And, and there is a tiny bit of umami that you have to really be trained to look for it. Um, you have to practice, not trained. But the kale is meatier, right? And, that, and it's that if you could even correlate, like if there's a little bit of mushroominess to a piece of kale versus the iceberg, does that make sense? Like, does that, can you imagine that? Like pulling, this extracting is... that umami flavor from a piece of kale, like comparing it to kind of mushroomy? Honestly, umami. honestly, this is all making sense on such a deeper level. Like you, <laughs> like we, you talk about kale and in the past you've talked about kale being this representation also of bitter, of maybe sour, but umami. Um, there's saltiness to kale too. Mm -hmm. Kale mm -hmm. is like, it, white, white is all the colors, right? Or black from a from a light perspective yeah yeah from a lighting perspective white yeah. is all the colors black is not black is the void of colors see in the paint in a paint world if you take all the colors and put them together you don't get white <laughs> you get right. the opposite of white <laughs> so whatever that is that's kale pigment right right yeah pigment kale like so that's why literally i mean this makes sense so that's why kale is so nutrient dense like right on the nutrient dense scale kale is up there what i don't i don't know what the number one nutrient dense food is but it makes sense because there's all these variations of it yeah so or you get the saltiness nuances. you get the umami you get the bitter you would get a tiny bit of sour in kale and this is where like i um you know i just start encouraging people to start tasting individual ingredients yeah. right taste them on their own and start looking for the nuances start looking for that saltiness in a piece of kale Start looking for the sour in a bite of an apple or the bitter in the bite of an apple, right? Like what we're missing out on and, and not having a conversation around flavor being a source of nutrients is the lack of awareness. We're not even aware, right? That there's this bitter element on skin. We've kind of gotten to the habit of taking the skin off for kids because, you know, kids don't like it. Well, kids kids taste buds are so much more trustworthy than ours are right so kids don't need as much detoxifying as we do so when they're kind of picky about their food trust that but keep introducing them to new foods right and this is what's happened with us now we're you know adults that think we know better because we've studied every nutrition book in the world but we have no idea how to trust our taste buds right well, we have no idea how to trust our own bodies and you know, at this point and to, you know, you brought up the the uh, you brought up the situation in India right now. So again, like as we're recording this episode, we're hopefully I would say we're hopefully towards the end of a pandemic. Um, but there's been some interesting stuff coming out of India, right? In terms of their because their numbers have dropped significantly, right? Yeah. So um, I was on a conference uh, just a couple weeks ago, and I don't know what they used to justify it, but. Um, it, this was a scientist, this was a, a um, I was on a conference that was being run out of, um, out of Harvard, and it was a nutritional conference. And this gentleman said that India has basically established herd immunity. And if you look at, you know, if you look at the health of India, I don't know anybody out there who's been to India, I have been to India, I have, you know, witnessed landing in the airport, not being able to see the sun because there's so much pollution, driving down the streets of literally just, you know, yards high, piles of trash, kids going through trash, animals going through trash, like, and yet it's, it, there's so much beauty in India. I'm not saying this to, it's just what it is, right? This is just what it's like there. And even before I went, and the whole reason that I went was because Years ago, I was creating spice blends. Like part of my journey is this study of spice blends or spices and the benefits of spices. And when I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's years ago, um, was fortunate enough to work with a nutritionist that you know took me down this nutrition path. And part of the process was taking these supplements. And I'm looking at the ingredients in the supplements, and I'm like, "There's turmeric. There's green tea. There's what's this ashwagandha thing, right? There's all these these." 
spices. And then when the, when I started looking into that and I was like, you look at the numbers in health in India and you start even just looking at turmeric alone, you know, they have turmeric in every meal over there. Their Alzheimer's is less, right? And now, you know, if there's truth in this whole thing that co their COVID, they have herd immunity, the populations in India are so compact. That whole, you know, social distancing thing, it's not a thing, right? So, you know, I'm a little nervous saying that because I don't, I didn't research to find out what the, what the real numbers are and what the, you know, but in my, just from my personal experience of studying disease comparisons in these countries that are eating more bitter, right? And using more herbal medicine, which is also a form of bitter, having, you know, thoughts outside of the box of just taking a vaccination or a pill to get better, but instead building your immunity, supporting your body, creating biodiversity in your body, like this whole idea of bitter, they eat more bitter, not only in spices, but also in like bitter melon, like their ingredients. They, they make these chutneys that go with their foods that have high levels of bitterness, but they're combining them with other flavors. So, you know, going back to that conversation about the successful choice in our diet, it always goes back to, are you eating, are you eating more vegetables? Are you all of a sudden drinking more tea? Are you all of a sudden putting cinnamon in your coffee? Like, how much more bitter have you just brought into your diet that you think is defined by whatever rules you're following? Your body's detoxifying more, right? You're, you're giving it more supportive flavors. Sherry, this is awesome. You literally like hit up like this, like every point, this makes so much sense to me now, like for real. Um, Oh, this is great. Thank you for talking to me about this. Like, for, I was like, I was just gonna interview, but I'm like, yeah, no, I get it now, and I get, I get how, um, I get how the different flavors inform nutrients, they inform health, and then they inform your digestion, they inform your health in general. Like, um, yeah, it just makes more sense to look at the plate differently. Yeah, and and, and it's just, you know, I see. I don't know, it probably won't happen in my lifetime, but I see this, you know, if we could come to this place where we can trust these categories of flavor as being something that should be nutritionally supported. And then we can also trust this idea that eating a delicious combination of these flavors is not just this pleasurable experience, but is also this like more effective function as it goes into your body. Like, Wouldn't it be beautiful if we could just trust our own bodies and trust the, the messaging that our bodies are giving us, you know, through our sense of taste, through all of our senses, really. But and that's such a different message, right? That is such a different message than um, no carbs or high protein or right. no sugar or no that like none of that is, seems relevant because like I I'm not a big bread person anymore. I love me the carbs. I love I love oatmeal, I love rice, I love potatoes, I love or starches, or whatever. I love all that stuff. But like, I don't like bread necessarily, but like there's no flavor in, in my, like when I think about it, my taste, but there's no flavor in bread. Right, and, and that's also because you're gluten-free, right? So back in the day when we were eating real whole grain wheat before we were dousing it in, you know, chemicals to process it and our immune system decided to go, what is going on here? Side note, um, you know, but when it was real, um, whole grain wheat and it was complex and you were keeping the bran on it and you were keeping the whole grain you weren't like processing the crap out of it you were just taking a grain and letting it dry and you're grinding it up so you're getting more bitter elements in that wheat mm. right so wheat the way it used to be did have a lot of flavor since wonder bread and then the gluten-free recreation of wonder bread bread doesn't have flavor right I mean, the gluten-free stuff, I'm gluten-free too. So, and I've been on that journey for a long time since before gluten-free was as varied as it is now. It's all just starches. It's all just these yeah. substitute starches and textures. So there is no, you know, some of them have seeds and stuff, which is somewhat nutritious, but most of it is just this overly processed recreation of texture is really what yeah. that is. It's funny. I, I, 
I um I, I I have some like in the freezer, like I have some gluten free bread and stuff, but like I seldom want to reach for it. I instead I'm like, what I I have this conversation in my head like every week. I'm like, why well, have the sandwich when we can have like let's get like a bunch of veggies in there as well and like like this huge plate versus like a little sandwich. Calorically, it's the same thing. Like it's it's ends up being the same if I pack it with Brussels sprouts and and rice broccoli, like chopped broccoli. Or, um, and calories is another one of those, you know, kind of tunnels that we've gone down, right? Yeah. Thinking I said that, that a calorie is a calorie is a calorie, and it's just not true. It's you know. I, I I know because and I was I love. But that's your true. diet culture, right? That's the diet culture you grew up in. That that we all grew up in. So it's hard to like escape that. I have that conversation in my house all the time. Well, if you look at the calories. I'm like, I don't look at calories. I know it's so <laughs> silly. And and <laughs> you know where I have the biggest like dramatic relationship with calories? This is I told you I'm obsessed with making my own guacamole. <laughs> but I'm like, no, like I'm by myself now. Like I'm like my daughter doesn't love guacamole, so I'm like, well, you know, I'm not gonna just get a whole avocado for myself, even though I would eat it, no problem. Yeah. And I'm not talking even like dipping chips in. I'm talking about just like straight up like out of a Oh, bowl. I love avocado. Yeah. 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 But it's like, I know the health benefits outweigh the perception of cal- Anyway, but that's for another day. Yeah. This was awesome. <laughs> this is such a helpful episode. Thank you so much, Sherry. Like, this well, was- thanks for, uh, thanks for interviewing me because I, like I said, I don't always, you know, I don't always explain it in a way that um, comes out easily in conversation. So it was so much easier to have you ask me questions, let me kind of go off on my tangents. Um, and hopefully at some point along the episode, we touched on each one of the flavors and each one of the benefits and, and how, you know, how they're kind of being presented to us these days and, and how to become more aware of not only what you're consuming, but, you know, the flavor in each individual thing. Yeah, you really did. You went salty, sweet, umami sour and bitter yeah cool yeah we hit up all of them and then and then and, and you also did a great job of like um of, of of showing us in reality i think like what those flavors look like how they like how they show up right in different foods and different processes yeah. um yeah i mean honestly this conversation makes me want to go hit up an indian buffet which is not a possibility right now but like i love <laughs> it's my favorite that's my... indian food is amazing oh but it's it's hard for people that you know aren't you feel people feel like they have to be adventurous and it is true like you have to be adventurous and you should be adventurous because you'll get more health benefits and more exciting options and things that taste good just like when we listen to you and all the stuff you teach us you get healthier more benefits more variations more excitement in life more adventure <laughs> well i hope so thank you <laughs> thank you sherry